This week on The Record, a shutdown showdown on Capitol Hill. Can a divided Congress keep the government open? The second most powerful member of the U.S. Senate makes his case to keep funding Ukraine's war effort. Plus, what's in those details of that spending fight? The urgent letter from Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski to Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Political analyst Anita Mannion breaks it down live in studio. And a special announcement about the future of The Record on the one-year anniversary of our launch. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to The Record, I'm Mark Maxwell. Tensions are building on Capitol Hill. House Republicans are pushing to open an impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. But Congress is running out of time to fund government operations in the meantime. If the House and Senate don't cut the government a big check, the money will run out at the end of next Saturday night, grinding much of government operations to a halt. That shutdown showdown starts in the Republican-led House, but would likely end in the Senate under Democratic control. And how might that dynamic, a divided Congress, contribute to the likelihood of a shutdown at all? He's the second most powerful U.S. Senator. Majority Whip Dick Durbin is now on the record. Senator, good to have you. It looks like we've got another government shutdown brewing. Seems to be a recurring theme these years. The government can't spend any money unless Congress writes that big check before the end of the month. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says just this week he might bring a short-term stopgap spending plan to the House floor. Would the Senate consider a short-term plan like that if it meant avoiding a shutdown? Well, I tell you, we've been waiting all week for something from the House of Representatives, and they've been unable to pass anything. Uh, what we're talking about here is the end of the fiscal year on September 30th. Uh, we've got a few days left to do our job and to keep the government open and services that people count on still coming to them. I don't know what he's going to send us. We're waiting patiently over here. We'll deal with it as quickly as we receive it. One of the points of contention that could upend any deal making is how much more money should America give Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invaders. The senior senators from Illinois and Missouri are divided on the matter. It's going to be, you know, hand out more requests for money. And my position on that's clear. My, main, my mind on that is made up. That is just a serious mistake when we consider security in the world. If we don't stop Putin here, we'll face him in another country tomorrow. Senator Durbin, you made a bit of a prediction there, but there are deterrents that would make that at least less likely. Ukraine is not a NATO member, while its neighbor countries are. Seems that would be a significant escalation. So when you predict Putin will invade another country, how do you know that? Well, I can tell you, I know Putin, and I know what he's done in, in countries he's already invaded, and what he's doing is a ruthless act of war in Ukraine. There was no provocation for his invasion. He's been branded a war criminal because of the activities of his troops in the field. And to have any question mark in your mind as to whether he's a nice guy we can trust, you should have been over that a long time ago. Switching gears here to closer to home, President Biden promised he'd be the greatest pro-union president ever. But on his watch, we've seen him upset railroad workers in that negotiation. Big strikes in Hollywood, the United Auto Workers, and now U.S. Steel says they're shutting down a furnace in Granite City as a ripple effect. Can President Biden claim that title, greatest pro-union president ever, if all this labor unrest is happening on his watch? Labor unrest, what we have is... Uh a contract about once every five years by the automakers and the United Auto Workers. Uh, and I think it's a legit legitimate issue they're raising. Why would the executives at this automobile companies be making 40% more and employees only 6%? Why was it in 1963 that they made 30 times uh, what the workers made in the executive suites and now it's up to 500 times? It's completely out of whack. These unions are standing up for working families, and we ought to respect them and do everything we can to help them. We mentioned U.S. Steel is blaming that ripple effect for shutting uh, from UAW shuttering down or ramping down one of its furnaces in Granite City, affecting hundreds of union jobs. Do you buy that? Well, I can understand it. I mean, they are, they're anticipating the possibility of a long-term strike. But if they can reach an agreement, and I hope they do soon, those steel companies will turn around on a dime. And quickly, I know we're running low on time, but on your Credit Card Competition Act, you said you're basically making the argument that Visa and MasterCard are reaching into the grocery shopping cart and taking their cut, if you will, as people still feel the sting of inflation. You've got this plan. You said it would break up their duopoly, you've called it. How would that work? It's something radical called competition. What we want to make sure is Visa and MasterCard say to retailers and restaurant owners and shop owners that you have competition when it comes to the Visa and MasterCard uh, people who use it at your businesses. Right now, the fee is imposed on these, on these businesses. 
with no negotiation. Take it or leave it. That's going to come to an end. All right, Senator, thank you for your time. We're back in a moment with Congresswoman Nikki Budzinski. What's the forecast in Florida? No matter where you are. What's the forecast in St. Peter's? Or how you get your weather. We know you want the forecast for your backyard. And you want it now. Right here and right now. The five on your side. Weather first team. Focused on you. With each hour that passes, Congress appears closer and closer to a government shutdown. But what will that look like for you at home, the economy at large, and for wars abroad? A group of 98 members of Congress that calls itself the New Democrat Coalition penned a letter to House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, urging him to include these items in any stopgap measure. Money for natural disasters, money to fund the fight against the fentanyl crisis, and enough money to help Ukraine defend its freedom. Congresswoman, thanks for joining us. Uh, in this joint letter to Speaker McCarthy, you write that Republicans and Democrats deserve the opportunity to show their constituents they're working to keep the government open, working responsibly, that is. The, the question just seems to be here, can Congress both spend money and conduct oversight? Can it do both in a divided Congress? We should be able to do that for America's working people. You know, I think we had a bipartisan agreement that was agreed to by this Speaker of the House, Speaker McCarthy, mm -hmm. and President Biden on spending levels and what our budget for this next year was going to look like when we had a conversation earlier in this year on raising the debt ceiling. These were um, agreed upon appropriations levels to continue to keep our government funding. And what we're seeing today, Mark, is hyperpartisanship. Uh, Speaker McCarthy completely rescinding on an agreement that he had made with the president on these spending levels and allowing the chaos caucus to take over the House floor. Uh, we're talking about 20, maybe 20 members of the House of Representatives having an outsized voice um, that's going to potentially uh, lead to a government shutdown on September 30th. And I think that working people deserve a hell of a lot better than that. Some of the specifics that that, that uh, you called uh, them, the called them the chaos caucus is calling for. Some of them want to see the Homeland Secretary, uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas impeached. You have said that we face serious challenges at our border and that they could be improved. How do you grade his performance so far? Look, I think we need to be continuing to secure our border. We are seeing an increase in uh, migrants getting to the border, and that's why we need a, a budget immediately. Part of of that um, budget that we, uh, the president has proposed is more funding for border security. But we are not getting to those issues because this House of Representatives, Republican leadership, is pursuing impeachment of, you mentioned Secretary Mayorkas. They're also looking into Hunter Biden. I have to tell you, Mark, when I go home, when I talk to working people in the district, what they talk to me about is how they're still struggling to make ends meet. What is their government doing for them to keep more of what they earn? What are we doing to get a farm bill done that's going to actually support our family farmers? Not these crazy witch hunts um, that the Republican leadership is taking us down that is just going to drive our government um, into um, a shutdown at the end of this month. It, it is total nonsense. To talk about something closer to home in Granite City, uh, what could possibly be perceived or translated as a spillover effect from the United Auto Workers strike. We've seen that happening, but now U.S. Steel is blaming that for layoffs, perhaps Im impacting hundreds of jobs in Granite City at their blast furnace. You're shaking your head no. I take you to mean you don't buy their reasoning there. Uh, but is there anything more you can do beyond what the state does to protect workers in these instances that might make some difference at U.S. Steel? First of all, let me just say I totally reject. I think it's total nonsense that um, the UAW strike, which has only been taking place for six days, has anything to do with what's happening in Granite City um, and the decisions that that company that's making record profits is making um, to lay off workers in Granite City and close and shut down temporarily, they're saying, that blast furnace. I want to talk about what I mean by temporary. Um, when it's temporary and a company decides to lay off a worker and temporarily for only six months or less, six months or less, if they plan to lay off that worker, that worker um, can be laid off immediately if, if that is, in fact, only a temporary layoff. 
six months or less. So what, and that's in the Warren Act. So what we are going to be paying very close attention to is if any of this is a permanent layoff, then they are in violation of the Warren Act. Um, because if you are in violation of the Warren Act, typically workers are given 60 days notice. And I really truly believe that if a worker is to be laid off, they have to have the time to prepare, to have that 60 days to prepare their family. That community needs that time to prepare for those layoffs. And so the Warren Act protects workers from immediate layoffs. Um, what U.S. Steel is saying, what Granite City Steel is saying is that these layoffs are, te are technically only temporary and so they don't have to abide by the Warren Act. But if it's a day over 60 and we're going to be following this, they will be in violation. I am working right now, though, to strengthen the Warren Act because I think that there shouldn't be these types of loopholes. I think workers deserve um, to have fair notice if they're going to be pink slipped. Congresswoman Bozinski, thank you for joining us. From the auto worker strike to the looming government shutdown, political analyst Dr. Anita Mannion weighs in on those biggest stories of the week next. Most people think this is St. Louis, but we know better. It's our neighborhoods our people. And that's our focus. Because no story is bigger than the one that affects you. Five on your side, focused on you. Welcome back. Our political analyst, Dr. Anita Mannion, joins us now to, with reaction here. Uh, we just heard from Congresswoman Mickey Budzinski. And I wonder, as you look at all of what's going on in Congress, with the pressure to investigate Hunter Biden, to impeach Mayorkas, even open the impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden. How does that 2024 presidential election uh, cloud the action or the motives of members of Congress now? Well, I think it's clear that we're in campaign season, and, and certainly that's what some of these investigations are. And partisan investigations and hearings are nothing new in Congress, but there's certainly a pressure from particularly um, ardent Trump supporters in the House to push forward with these efforts. And we saw now, even now in the last few moments since we've spoken with Congresswoman Bidzinski, that some of the House Republicans seem to be losing their grip on the calendar. They have members that have to go home. They don't know if they have enough votes to pass these spending resolutions. So some of them are starting to leave Capitol Hill now and make their travel plans. It looks increasingly like there could be this government shutdown. And it, we keep having these recurring issues. Uh, do voters at some point tune out of that? Do they? Does it just give them a bad taste in their mouth toward Congress? Well, every year it feels like we have this big debate. We're at the debt crisis. Or are we going to fund government? But usually go Congress will pull it together in the last minute and push something forward. About three times in the last 40 years we've experienced this kind of government shutdown. And the longest one, though, was under former President Trump, 34 days. And estimates are that that cost $3 billion to our economy. It seems there's a more robust debate unfolding in the Republican primary, the presidential primary, and within the Republican caucus on Capitol Hill over just how much support the U.S. should continue giving to Ukraine. Right. How do you see that issue playing out as we go into this presidential election year? We saw J Josh Hawley saying he doesn't want to give any more money there. Senator Durbin across the river does. He thinks that's an important line to draw. How does that uh, affect voters' minds coming up this year, you think? Well, the Senate seems to support funding Ukraine um, in a largely bipartisan way with Josh Hawley being one of the notable exceptions. But in the House, we saw about a third of Republicans vote this summer to not fund Ukraine. Overall, now uh, funding Ukraine is being less popular with Republican voters, about 70 percent saying we should cut funding. Where if you think back a year or more ago, how Americans were really rallying around Ukraine. But, you know, I think there's this fatigue maybe among some and amongst some idea of like, why are we sending our money overseas? But Democrats would argue, as we heard Dick Durbin say, this is essential to national security to keep this funding going. Mm -hmm. uh, and closer to home, why did we focus on the labor question, the unrest? We're seeing the United Auto Workers. It's interesting enough, in the second Republican primary debate, Donald Trump is skipping that to go where? To speak to labor workers, union members in Michigan, a swing state there, of course. Uh, just how critical is that voting block, the, the working class, the union members, 
in 2024. This is a big block that we saw shift from sort of that union Democrat to a Trump voter. And so um, Trump made lots of promises during his campaign to bring those manufacturing jobs back. I think he's got kind of an uphill battle to justify that he did that. And then Biden tries to make, go after the same group by saying he's the most pro-union president ever. But we are in a time where we're seeing lots of um, labor disruption, particularly in the wake of the pandemic. And so people are frustrated. They feel like the economy is not you know, treating them right. And so we're seeing these actions and this disruption happen. And Biden's rhetoric suggests to union members that uh, Donald Trump sees them from the Wall Street perspective, from the Manhattan perspective. He sees them from the Scranton, Pennsylvania perspective. Um, but when you see all this labor unrest happening, strikes popping up across the country in different sectors, different industries, is that a sign that the president, President Biden, isn't delivering? Or is it a sign that rather workers feel under his leadership, they have a bit more of a bargaining chip. You know, I'm not sure that those workers are really thinking about Joe Biden, but I think they are thinking about timing. So for the UAW in particular, with um, one part that I guess Biden could influence is this push for electric cars. So that could make it a lot tougher for UAW workers. They'd need fewer workers. Uh, there'd be less pressure on automakers. And so I think they feel like it's time to strike while the iron's hot before that industry sees a big shift. And it seems that uh, whether you're looking at the government shutdown or the, these strikes uh, in Hollywood, strikes in the auto industry, disruption seems to be the theme of the day. How does that factor into just the, the overall image or the direction of the economy, the direction of the country, if disruption's happening here, there, and everywhere? I think that amongst Americans, we look at polling and people are just feeling dissatisfied. They feel like things aren't fair. And we saw this during the pandemic where there were different uh, pushbacks against shutdowns or people being upset about job losses with the Black Lives Matter movement. People really kind of standing up for where they think they see injustice. I think part that's part of this disruption. We also see a time in which for the first time in a while, laborers have a little leverage. It's a tight labor market and it's a time where they can sort of stand up and take these stands and feel maybe a little bit more secure than they would have in the past. It's interesting, too. Uh, we, we talk about inflation in the economy, and early at, in this discussion, we had that back and forth between Dick Durbin and Josh Hawley. On, they, they have a different idea on Ukraine. But when it comes to inflation, both of them are proposing caps on credit card companies. One, Josh Hawley wants to cap how much they can charge you in interest. Two, Dick Durbin says he's got this idea. He wants to break up the duopoly and make it easier for other companies to compete with them for their share of that fee. What does that tell you about the overall political uh, feeling toward banks, the banking industry, the, the finance sector itself? Yeah, I think the finance sector in sort of just like the rich corporate fat cats, as people might think of them in general, people do feel like they're not paying their fair share, like the everyday working class American isn't being treated fairly. Um, Josh Hawley sort of jumped on this populist bandwagon that's going after these folks as well. So it's interesting, Dick Durbin's bill is a bipartisan bill. So there's Republican and Democratic support. And it reminded me of Joe Biden's State of the Union address, where he's talking about the unfair fees, even when you're traveling and these things. So I think, again, this goes back to the issue that even though jobs are good, um, wages are good. People feel disgruntled and unhappy. And so it's trying to find some of those avenues where people feel like they're being treated unjustly. And I don't know that Josh Hawley speaks for the entire Republican Party when I he says those fair. things. Some Missouri Democrats have said, oh, he's using this progressive rhetoric now because he faces election next year. Yeah, I, I, you know, that's probably a fair criticism. We all uh, notice politicians shift during election season. But I do think that Josh Hawley has been using some of this populist rhetoric for the last few years in a number of ways and sort of these ideas of like keeping our dollars here in the U.S. instead of sending them to the Ukraine. And he described some of that in this op-ed in the New York Post. We'll have uh, more on that in the weeks to come. Anita Mania, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. An important programming note next. Get the content that matters to you on your time. Breaking news as it happens. We are following breaking news at this hour. Weather alerts when you need them. Live streams and newscasts on your schedule, on air, online, on our app, and on 5 Plus. No matter where you go or how you watch, 5 on your side, focused on you. Today, we celebrate the anniversary of this program. It was one year ago, if you can believe it, today, that we launched the record here with you on 5 Plus. And soon, We'll have a new home. Starting Sunday night, October 29, the record will premiere on broadcast TV. 
In addition to streaming here on 5 Plus and our digital platforms, the record will be televised. We'll come on right after Sports Plus with Frank Cusimano. We're excited to be able to meet you there, and we're grateful for all of your support here that made all this possible. Now, we want to make that jump from the internet to the TV, or those wires and lights in the box, as Ed Murrow called it. But we'll continue our tradition of holding current events up to the light of history to let the record reflect on how our world is changing. So this week, let's do that. Let's check the record to see why we do what we do here after all. Edward Murrow once said, we hardly need to be reminded that we're living in an age of confusion. A lot of us have traded in our beliefs for bitterness and cynicism, or for a heavy package of despair, or even a quivering portion of hysteria. Opinions can be picked up cheap in the marketplace, while such commodities as courage and fortitude and faith are in alarmingly short supply. That quote was from 1951, 72 years ago. On this program, all these years later, we hope to dispense with those cheap opinions in favor of those more valuable commodities. Murrow reported from the front lines of World War II. He saw things up close that would certainly shape the opinions of anyone. And if anyone had the right to preach those opinions, it might well have been him. Yet, he remained more curious than condescending, more determined to drill down to answers than dogmatic that he had already found them. It's that sense of courage, uh, courageous curiosity we hope to pursue here. Remembering that line Murrow once said, just the fact that your voice amplified to the degree where it reaches from one end of the country to the other does not confer upon you greater wisdom than when your voice just reached only from one end of the bar to the other. We'll try to do our part to remember that here. Thanks again to all of you in tuning in who have helped to make this show a success. And a special word of thanks to Ashley Brandmeier, Jacob Kurth, and Nicole Sanders who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this show happen. Many of you haven't seen their work per se, but you've seen it here. We'll take these next two weeks off as we prepare for the switch to broadcast, but we'll see you back right here on Thursday, October 12th. Until then, we're off the record.